As early as the first century, there were those who refused to believe that a loving God could be capable of both mercy and judgment. Hi, I'm Bill Wright. The book of Jude was written to combat this apostasy, and it includes some choice words for those who claimed God's judgment was a myth. Pastor Dick Woodward surveys this short but powerful book on today's Mini Bible College. Let's join him right now. Before we put in perspective the book that everyone has been waiting for, the Revelation, we would like to put in perspective one of the short books of the New Testament, one of the shortest, the Epistle of Jude. The Epistle of Jude, of course, was written by a man named Judas, and the name Judas was as common in the day of the New Testament as Bob or Bill or Dick is in our day. And just as Dick is another form of Richard and Bob's another form of Robert and Bill's another form of William, Jude is another form of the name Judas. And this name Judas is very common in the New Testament. As the scholars search through the names of people who are called Judas in the New Testament, as they consider the fact that this man tells us he is the brother of James, they conclude that this was another one of the earthly brothers of Jesus, which means he was also the brother of the man who wrote the epistle of James. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 3, in the Living Bible, you have this description of how they were discussing the fact that Jesus was a man just like other people. He had brothers and sisters and so forth. It goes this way. He's no better than we are, they said. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy, and the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. Well, that Judas that's named there in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, the scholars feel is the author of this little epistle called Jude. Now, Jude tells us as he writes this short epistle that he had planned to write a treatise on salvation, but there was a problem that existed that changed his mind, and that problem was the problem that has always existed in the New Testament period, in the Old Testament period, and down through church history. It's the problem of apostate teachers, people that were not teaching the right doctrine. This particular apostasy is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. It's always been with us. It's the teaching that because God is a gracious God, God would never discipline his children. He would never excommunicate anyone from salvation or the church. And so we're told, that Jude decided to address this particular apostasy that really said you can do as you please and a gracious God would never do anything about it. Now Jude seems to be very concerned about this apostate teaching and he's concerned about the people who have obviously been affected by this apostate teaching. He's concerned about people who seem to be falling from grace or falling away from faith probably because of the apostate teaching about cheap grace. As he addresses this problem, he takes it on head on, and he says, I want to make it clear to you, my brothers, that God doesn't just sit by in a state of apathy while people do as they please. And he gives some examples of this. He says, remember, in the 14th chapter of Numbers, the whole generation of God's chosen people that were wiped out there in the desert, this focuses upon one of the most awesome chapters in the entire Bible, the 14th chapter of the book of Numbers, where somewhere between two and three million people were stricken dead in the wilderness, their bones bleached white in that wilderness, and the vultures picked them clean because they simply would not believe God and invade the promised land. Back there in the book of Numbers, remember, they went around in circles for 40 years, they didn't have the faith to go into the promised land, and we often wonder, why didn't they just go into the promised land? But of course, going into the promised land was like our invasion of Normandy when we invaded Europe, when the Allied powers invaded Europe. It takes a lot of faith to put together an invasion and then attack those fortresses and all kinds of fortifications that have been built against you. And so these people went around in the wilderness for 40 years because they didn't have the faith to invade Canaan. And ten times, in miraculous ways, God miraculously proved himself to them and tried to get them to believe, but he never could bring them to faith. And so he says to them finally in the 14th chapter of Numbers, you're never going to invade that promised land because you said that if you did, your children would be slaves there. Your children are going to be the ones who will enter into the promised land. 
He makes two exceptions, Caleb and Joshua. But remember, back there in the book of Numbers, that awesome chapter, Numbers 14, where God lets a whole generation of his people perish, even though they are the chosen people, apparently God feels they have chosen not to be chosen, and so he lets them perish in the wilderness. Now, Jude reminds us of that, and he reminds the false teachers of that, who say you can do as you please and God won't do anything about it, as if God were some kind of an indifferent, apathetic old grandfather. Now, the scriptures will teach us that there's another side to the loving character of God. His character is like a rainbow. It's made up of many colors, not just one. He is capable of love because that's the essence of what he is, but he's also capable of wrath and judgment because he's a holy God. Now, another example he gives is the fallen angels. He said the fallen angels were cast into the bottomless pit, and so God didn't just sit by and watch the angels who didn't do his will without doing anything about the fallen angels. And then, finally, he gives the other example, the third example of Sodom and Gomorrah and how Sodom and Gomorrah perished in fire and brimstone. So he's giving these examples to say to these false teachers and the people who are falling for the false teaching of cheap grace, Grace isn't cheap. Salvation isn't cheap. You can't purchase it with all the gold and silver in the world. God had to purchase it for you. And when you believe it, that settles it. And there's a sense in which your salvation doesn't cost you anything. You accept it by faith. But if you're saved, faith alone can save. But the faith that saves, as we saw in the book of James, written by his brother, the faith that saves is never alone. There will always be that life of commitment and obedience to validate that faith. And so that seems to be the thrust of the message of this little epistle of Jude. Now, as he gives us descriptions of these apostate teachers, he's very vivid, just as Peter was in 2 Peter chapter 2. He calls them evil smears. He calls them clouds blowing over dry land without giving rain, promising much but producing nothing. Have you ever heard a preacher like that? Perhaps you were the dry ground. You're like parched earth, and you have this great thirst to have a word from God. And this preacher in his sermon is like a cloud that looks as if it's full of rain. It promises much, but after the cloud is blown over, it doesn't drop a drop of rain on you. You don't get anything out of that sermon that really comes from God, that really quenches your thirst. Well, Jude says that's what those false teachers are like. He says they're like dirty foam along the beach left by wild waves. They're like wild waves who leave dirty foam on the beach. They're like fruit trees without fruit. That's the illustration his brother constantly gave. Fruit that is either going to demonstrate reality or the lack of it. Fruit trees without fruit, doubly dead because they have been uprooted. And then here's another description. They're like wandering stars that streak off into the dark gloom that God has prepared for them. That kind of parallels the fate of the fallen angels. Well, this is the way he vividly describes the false teachers. And then he's very concerned about those who have been victims of their false teaching. And he tells us that we are to try to reclaim these people and perhaps snatch some out of the fire as if they're a brand that's being snatched out of the fire. We should try to snatch them out of the fire without getting burned ourselves. And then he has some exhortations to those people who have been reclaimed and perhaps to all of us just plain exhortations about staying true to the faith. And I like these. He says, learn to pray in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I like this one. You should stay always within the boundaries where God's love can reach and bless you. Jude ends with a blessing, with a beautiful blessing. Perhaps you've heard your pastor pronounce it as a benediction. He makes it clear as he writes to them and to us, that God is able to keep us from falling, whether it's false teachers that cause us to stumble or whatever it may be. He writes, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen. Well, that's the beautiful epistle of Jude. And now, let's come to the book that everyone's been waiting for ever since we began to survey the Bible, beginning with the book of Genesis. The Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and there's a reason, there are perhaps many reasons, why those who organized the Bible 
were led by the Holy Spirit to put this book last. One of the reasons why they put it last is because it's the most difficult book in the Bible to understand, and the prerequisite to understanding the Revelation is the other 65 books of the Bible. We'll see why that's true. But for these two reasons, because it's a very difficult book, and one of the most helpful things in understanding it is an understanding of the other 65 books of Scripture, for these reasons the translators put this book last. Another reason why this book was put last is because there are two areas of truth about which we could know nothing if we did not have a revelation. The word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, and it means to pull back a veil. And the concept is this, there's something behind a thick veil, and you could never in a million years guess what it is. So God pulls back the veil and lets you see what is behind that veil. A revelation, technically, is something that you know because God pulled back a veil and showed it to you, and if he hadn't given you this revelation, this experience of removing the veil, you could never in a million years have guessed what it was. Now, the two areas of truth about which we could know nothing, really, without a revelation, are the way the Bible begins and the way the Bible ends. The Bible begins with the book of Genesis. And the word Genesis we saw when we surveyed Genesis is like beginnings. It's like our word genetics. It has to do with the beginning of everything. Now, that's an area of truth about which we could really know nothing if God didn't give us a revelation. God humbled a great thinker and a great spiritual man of God named Job by asking him this question. Where wast thou when I created the heavens and the earth? Declare, if thou hast knowledge. What that really means is, how do you know, Job? Were you there? Job had been talking about creation as if he knew something about it. Well, that's a very humbling question because think about this. Were you there when God created the heavens and the earth? Was anybody really there when God created the heavens and the earth? Well, then how do you know so much about creation? Tell us all about it if you were there. Well, nobody was there. Now, this means, of course, that the scientists cannot really speak with authority on the subject of creation, even though scientists do. The scientific method has to do with observation, experimentation, and then application. The scientist makes observations, he conducts experiments, and then he makes his applications. And for it to be a scientific application, or in order to come to a scientific conclusion, a scientist has to do those three things. He has to be there, he has to observe and experiment, and only then can he conclude scientifically. Well, the subject of creation by a direct act of God is really not under the purview of the scientist as we saw when we surveyed the first two chapters of Genesis. Now the philosopher, he can philosophize about the beginning of everything. I had a course once in philosophy where the professor ended a whole year of philosophy by drawing these conclusions, and he put them on the chalkboard. He said, the things we've learned this year I would like to itemize. He said, the first thing is, and he wrote this on the chalkboard, I don't know. And after listening to him for a whole year, that wasn't too hard to take. We were easy to convince that he didn't know. And then his second conclusion was, you don't know. And of course, if he didn't know with all of his education, who were we to say that we knew? His third conclusion was, nobody else knows. And after all the collateral reading we had to do, that wasn't too hard to take. They didn't seem to know either. And his fourth conclusion was, it's intelligent to think about it. Now that's philosophy. I don't know, you don't know, nobody else knows, but it's intelligent to think about it. Now the philosopher, he can give us his conjecture on creation, and he can say in the final analysis, I don't know, you don't know, nobody else knows. We're all agnostic about it, really, but it is intelligent to think about it. But there is one man who can speak with authority on the subject of creation, and that is the prophet who says, I have had a revelation. The prophet who has had a revelation from God can speak with authority on the subject of creation if he has indeed had a revelation from God. Now you may say he hasn't had any such thing. Well, that's where the faith comes in. You either believe the Bible is a revelation of God or it is not a revelation of God. But the men who wrote it, and many of us as we come to it, do believe that this is a revelation from God. This is God communicating with man 
through the vehicle of revelation and inspiration is considered special revelation as you study revelation. Well, as you come to the Bible, you discover that the Bible begins with a prophet saying, I have had a revelation from God. God has pulled back the veil and he has shown me how it all began. And unless God pulled back the veil, we never would know for sure how it all began. The other area of truth about which we could not know for certain without a revelation is how it's all going to end. What in the world is going to happen? How can you know about the future? Well, you don't know unless God gives a revelation. So the Bible ends with a prophet, the Apostle John, saying, God gave me a revelation. I was on the island of Patmos and on the Lord's day, which means the first day of the week, I was caught up in the spirit and the Lord gave me a revelation. He just pulled back a veil and he gave me a revelation of Jesus Christ, but he also gave me, along with that revelation of Jesus Christ, a revelation about the future. He showed me how it's all going to end. He showed me what in the world is going to happen. So the Bible begins with a revelation of how it all began, and the Bible ends with a revelation of how it's all going to end. Now as we approach this revelation of John, which is really a revelation of Jesus Christ that was given to John, as we'll see, I would like to give you an assignment. At the beginning of your notes, you'll see that we've given you a chart with vertical columns, and at the top of each of these columns, we have different words, and I would like to explain that assignment because it's a, an important part of our approach to this book. Remember, the purpose of a survey of the Bible is to overview a book and introduce it, put it in perspective, show you how to approach it so you can get something out of it for yourself. The most important part of this course will begin in just a little while when we have concluded our last lecture because it's my prayer that the end of this instruction will be the beginning of your own study. Now, as you study the Revelation, the most difficult book in the Bible and the last book in the Bible, this is how I would recommend that you study it and approach it. In the first column on this chart, we have the word sign. What we mean by that is this. Here's how the revelation begins. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. John is on the island of Patmos. He's exiled there for his faith. Tradition says he was boiled in oil and didn't die. And since Jesus had said to Peter, remember Peter asked the question, apparently the Lord told him how he was going to die. Peter was always boasting about the fact that he was willing to die for Jesus. So in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus put his arm around Peter and told him how he was going to die. Now, if tradition's correct, that means Jesus told Peter he was going to be crucified upside down. And Peter, being very human, pointed to his partner, John. They were partners in the Zebedee Seafood Corporation. And he said, what about him? And Jesus said, if I will that he lives till I come back again, what's that to you, Peter? You follow me. That's none of your business, my plan for John. Well, the rumor got around, tradition says, that people believed that John was never going to die because Jesus had said this. And so tradition says again that when they boil him in oil and he didn't die, they decided just to put him on the Isle of Patmos and see if he would die. Some say he was there by himself, like Robinson Crusoe. Some say that he was there working in salt mines, uh, part of a slave labor situation. We're not sure about all these things. It's all based upon tradition anyway. But at any rate, John was on the Isle of Patmos and he was there because of his faith. We know that because he tells us that in this first chapter. And he had this experience of a revelation. God pulled back the veil and gave him a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now don't call it revelations, plural, because if you do, you'll show everybody that you've never read the opening sentence because the opening sentence of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not many revelations. It's one revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this revelation was given to John in this literary form. It was signified by an angel unto John. Now the word signified could be paraphrased, signified. It just means it was given to him in sign language. 
the Jews required a sign. They had this sign language, and you can really experience what that means when you come to the Revelation. John always writes in sign language. He does that, I believe, in his gospel. But here you have the Revelation, a book of signs. Now, as you go through the Revelation, in column number one, list those signs, the white horse, the sea of glass, the four beasts, whatever you may come across. Now, in the second column, we have at the top of the column, personal revelation. Ask God the Holy Spirit to pull back the veil for you and show you what that sign means. Put that in the second column. Since these symbols or signs are biblical signs, and they are found elsewhere in the Bible, and if you find them where they're located elsewhere in the Bible and understand what they mean there, it can help you to understand what they mean here. Since that's true, in the third column, we have the word or the scripture. List where this sign is found elsewhere in the scripture. Now, many godly people, spiritual people, have written commentaries on the book of Revelation, and they've told us what they feel the Spirit has shown them these signs mean. So get some commentaries on Revelation and put down in the next column what the commentaries tell you this means. And then in the last column in this chart, put down your final conclusion. Now, if you do this assignment, you should end up with about 150 pages of chart for the book of Revelation. And if this were not a mini Bible college, I would ask you to come up with about 150 pages of this homework. Now, as we come to the book of Revelation and actually approach it, we should understand something about this sign language book. It's almost as if this is a book written from God to the people of God in code. And in order to understand this message, you need the keys that break that code. When you're in a war, the enemy always has coded messages and you have coded messages. And your cryptography experts are trying to break the enemy code and they're trying to break your code. Well, approach the revelation this way. And as you approach the revelation this way, I would like to suggest that it's a message written in code to the people of God. And if you expect to understand that message, you need to have the keys that break the code. And here, in my opinion, are some of the keys that break the code of the Revelation. Of course, the first key is the Holy Spirit. You can't understand spiritual things without the Holy Spirit, and that's especially true when you come to this book, because it's not only the function of the Holy Spirit to teach us spiritual things, but in the upper room, Jesus said it is his special function to show us things to come. And this book has to do so much with things to come. You really need to have the Holy Spirit as you come to this book. That's key number one. Key number two is that these symbols or signs in the Revelation are biblical symbols. That's an important key that will help you understand this book. If you were a Jew steeped in the Old Testament, these signs in the Revelation would not be nearly so foreign to you as they are to the average person who reads the Revelation without a Bible background. For example, in chapter 4 of the Revelation, a door opens in heaven and you see into heaven. This is one of the rare places where you see into heaven. Somebody's sitting on a throne and the one who's sitting on this throne is like a jasper and a sardis stone and around about the throne on which he's sitting there is a rainbow like an emerald. If you were a Jew steeped in the Old Testament, you would know that in Exodus chapter 28, when the garments were described there and designed that the high priest was to wear in the tabernacle in the wilderness, he was to wear a breastplate, and in that breastplate were embedded a jewel for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. The first jewel was a sardis, and that was for the oldest tribe of Israel, the tribe of Reuben, and the last jewel, the twelfth one, was a jasper, and that represented the tribe of Benjamin. And the emerald was the seventh jewel, which represented the tribe of Judah. In Hebrew, these names mean something. Reuben means, behold my son. And Benjamin means, the son of my right hand. And Judah means, praise. And so, what you're getting here in sign language in chapter 4, when this door opens into heaven, is this. Son of my right hand, behold my son, praise him. You see, to a Jew, that's sign language. And that's a very beautiful thing. It's an inspired, Holy Spirit-inspired sign language. And that's what you will find in this book of Revelation from the time you open the book of Revelation. A beautiful sign language. Now, as I say, it's like a message from God to the people of God in code. 
And if you expect to understand that message, then you need to understand the keys that break that code, the code of that message. The first key, you might say the master key, is the Holy Spirit. You can't skip over that one because you will never understand any scripture, even the Gospel of John, without the Holy Spirit. But with the Holy Spirit as your master key, here's another important key that will help you break the code of this beautiful coded message of God to his people. All of these symbols, all of these signs are biblical signs. And if you look them up in a concordance perhaps and find out what they mean when they're found elsewhere in the scripture, you have a very good chance of understanding what they mean here in the Revelation. Take these two keys and see if they won't help you break the code of the coded message of God to his people, which we find in the last book of the Bible, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. God didn't write the Bible for his own purposes. He wrote it for us. And through the Holy Spirit, he is able and willing to explain it to us. All we have to do is ask, and he will gladly pull back the veil. Well, that wraps up another day of fine teaching with Pastor Dick Woodward. And I hope you've been blessed by the presence of the Lord today as you've listened. And if you enjoyed today's program, I hope you'll join us again next time as Pastor Dick takes us once again into a new lesson as he continues teaching us through the Bible. Thank you, and may God bless you until we meet again.